Hi, Mike. How's so chill? Welcome. Hi, Ben. Hello, hi, hi ben. thanks for having thanks. us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Do you think we answered all? Do we cover all the ground about how to survive a, a recession, or would you like to <laughs> yeah. quickly add something? What just as we're on that point before we dive into your story, what's your, you know, if you take yourself back to the beginning of um, Brixton Brewery, if you were going into this period that we're facing now, what would be your sort of thinking? Yeah, it's a that's a really difficult question, um, and it's a difficult to have the exact answer that I think would you know, be right for everyone. But I think, you know, looking back and, and thinking about what position we'd be in now, I think it really does come down to focusing on the key priorities of the business and, you know, deciding what's most important for the business itself. I think often in the startup world, uh, it's easy to get pulled in every direction and, and always wanting to make everyone happy. Uh, whereas, in fact, in an environment of rising costs and uh, and more challenging um, economic environment, you really need to stick to your guns and and do the things that um, that you feel are most beneficial to the future of the business, uh, and really sticking to those priorities. Um, and you know, backing yourself, backing oneself. Yeah, I think that's fair. I also think that. Um, sometimes if, if you can sort of make it in a difficult environment, then that's quite good training for um, making it when things ease off a little, because it is important to remember that the way things are right now is not how there will always be. There may be other challenges, but um, the ones that are right now, you know, things will things will change. I feel like we're going to burst into kind of an Alicia Keys version of New York. Like you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. <laughs> like I, good, good, saying. solid. Yeah. <laughs> good solid wisdom up front so yeah let, let's you've got a wonderful story and um many people listening in will not have heard of it so we'd love to share it but before we do what's um maybe you could shine a light on a current favorite startup um that you each have sure well, you go ahead. Oh, um think so while you're going. Think, yeah, think quick um <laughs> for me um my uh, other passion outside of of beer is cycling. And I um, am a big fan of a company called Scribe who uh, are currently, well not currently, they are based in, in Northern Ireland, in Belfast. And they are making carbon wheels uh, for cyclists. Um, and they make some pretty amazing products and they're punching way above their weight in, in the market and, and against the competition that they have. And uh, I was lucky enough through Bricks and Brewery to do a, a collaboration with, with Scribe earlier in the year where um, we got to design a set of custom wheels. And then uh, along with one other um, guy from their team, I rode them from um, Belfast back to London. Um, and so I think those guys are doing some amazing things in, in the cycling space. And for a super small team, they're, they're really doing uh, some, some excellent work uh, to sort of break into a sphere that is, you know, a really difficult, difficult sector to break into. So quite, quite proud of them and what they've done. That sounds like a big bucket li list tick right there for you. It, it um, was my friends, my friends say you've managed to, um, you managed to coordinate the most niche collaboration ever. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which is true. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's perfect. It suited me down to the, down to the ground. I'm not sure about everyone else. It was like Taylor <laughs> it's the Hay. only time those that Venn diagram would overlap. Exactly. You to find the spot. Overlap. So chill. <laughs> right. Um, and, and Virgin Startup team, let, let's drop these links into the chat as we go. So that was, remind us again of the brand, Mike. Uh, Scribe Cycling. Scribe Cycling. -E Great. -E, yeah. All right. Scribe Cycling have their shout out. So chill, yeah. what about you? Oh, see now I'm cheating a little bit and they don't, they definitely don't need the publicity, but I was very, very interested to see what Patagonia did this past week. Um, if people haven't heard the, oh, is that, is that the book That's by? That's the original, yeah. Let my people go surfing by uh, the main man. Oh, 
<laughs> well, how about that? Um, yeah, so I don't know if people heard what they did, but essentially I'm probably going to get the sort of business details of it wrong, but they basically turned over their business um, to their employees, not entirely because I think they've retained the, um, the bulk of the voting shares on their board, so they'll still have that kind of control, and they've made their main shareholder of the planet, so everything that they do is going to be um, all of their resources going back into help, helping environmental issues. And I mean, I know it, it definitely doesn't count as a startup, but I just think it's such an interesting model for businesses to look at and follow and to aspire to do things in a better way as much as we can where the opportunities are there and to really follow through on those beliefs. So I was really I, I'm so I'm so pleased you said that. And of course, you're not they're not a startup, but for 40, 49 years, I think they've been leading the way and kind of like continually innovating and sticking to those first principles. And that one of the things that I love about the Patagonia story is that um you know, he, he they set out building. They were doing um, they were climbers, weren't they, in Patagonia? And they were they were making mm -hmm. the reason they started making these clips, different kind of clips for the rock faces, was because they didn't want to bash these bolts into the rock face and damage nature. They were like, "Come on, we're here to enjoy and embrace." And and that that kind of first principle of like what our first product was going to be, like, has stayed throughout because it's like, how do we? have a great life and adventure and take care of each other, but not damage it, this world that we we belong to. And they've done it. And now there's $3 billion in the pot for climate action, um, which proves that you can be an activist and a successful business. It's a great shout out. Um, so moving on from one great brand to another, Brixton Brewery, take us back to 2013 and um, how this idea surfaced, presumably in a pub. A uh, bar. Uh, it, was, it was actually 2010. Um, was it? Okay. So, yeah, it took a little while to, to get going, but actually um, what happened was we were, we had a newborn baby. She was probably about six weeks old. Um, and we were kind of wandering around as new parents do, like wondering what you do with this new life, you know, on a, on a Sunday. Um, and we live in, we live in Brixton still, and we lived in Brixton at the time. And there were not all that many places to eat in Brixton, which at the time, which is mind blowing now because like you can't move for new places. Um, but yeah, there weren't a lot of places where you could go for sort of a good burger or a good uh, meal. But we we went to one that was quite well known at the time um, called The Hive, The Hive Bar. And we went and we're the only people in there except for another couple who was in there and they also had a newborn baby. So obviously we got to talking to them. And then um, the coincidence is sort of piled one on top of the other. And it turned out that they actually lived on the same street as us, right across the street from us. So we sort of struck up a conversation and, and a friendship. And it turned out that we were also all united in our love of craft beer, which at the time in the UK was sort of kind of just taking off. And it was a bit behind. Mike and I are both from Canada originally. And yeah. it's a little bit behind Canada, which is unusual because Canada's not usually ahead of the UK in, in most things like that. <laughs> I don't know. Your your mountaineer, your um, your uh, police force were leading the funeral the other day. That's yeah. true. Yeah. That's yeah. True. They call, what are they called? The guys on horses. The, Nazis, mounted police. the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Yeah. There you go. You see. So no leading in craft beer and police police <laughs> <and> royal <laughs> funerals. Yeah. So yeah, why, but craft beer in 2010 wasn't obviously on the street of the UK. So how was it defined in your conversation? Uh, I think you have to take that one because you probably. First yeah, I think I think yeah the funny. It, it wasn't. It was more that I think both both Jez and I the, we just got to talking about beer in general, and I think both of us had this um, interest in being involved in the beer world somehow. Um, I had always wanted to open a brew pub when I was back in Canada, you know, after university, um, and he had harbored this you know desire to open a brewery. So. We, we got to talking about the whole manufacturing bit of it and how things were coming to the UK and people were doing this and the likes of the Colonel Brewery, um, who are kind of considered to be, um, you know, forefathers, maybe not the right word, but the pioneers in, in the UK for the modern craft beer movement. Um, and so, you know, we would go and visit their site on Malty Street and, you know, experiment with with the beers that they were, were tasting. Um, and it just felt like, you know, we had this uh, common interest and something had to be done about it, really. I think we, we also felt like Brixton was just such a special place 
and such a kind of dynamic and lively place that it would basically be the perfect place to have a brewery as well and to sort of base a base a brewery around. So there was that that was a factor as well. And and tell me, reflect for a moment on those motivations in those early days. Obviously, Mike, you've just talked about your sort of your, your interest in the craft brewery movement and where it could go. Did did um, business ideas come into this career thoughts? Because with with two newborns, two two mm-hmm. couples, it's not the obvious time to start thinking about jumping ship from whatever career you're in into a startup. No, and that is very true. And it wasn't actually that quick, our, our jumping into the startup. As Sochil said, that, that discussion was in 2010. Uh, we didn't actually open the brewery until 2013. So there was a lot of background discussion, um, you know, working toward that moment of opening. And I think, you know, when, when we started, well, before we started, the big question was how how are we going to brew? Because actually, for certainly for for Jez and and myself, we weren't willing to quit our jobs to make the leap of faith. So Chiel, um, having just had our daughter, hadn't yet gone back to work and was like, "Well, I'll, I can be your I can be your brewer. Let's let's go on a course, and I'm sure it'll be no problem. I know how to cook." Um, and uh, and then we quickly realized that actually brewing on an industrial scale was different to brewing in your kitchen. Was um, that the baby brain so chill, like still working <laughs> or not working back then? Because the idea of like, oh yeah, I can I can brew something, or is that part of no, who you, well, who you are is, as a person? This has become like a little bit of a story that's got twisted over the years. It's <laughs> totally accurate. I mean, I did because think of him. I did. Yeah. Well, I did think it's usually me that exaggerates and, and uh, doesn't let um, the truth get in the way of a good story. But um, actually, I did probably like I did probably think I could be the brewer, um, which I totally couldn't because I'm very much like one of those cooks that just throws everything into the pot and hopes for the best. So that's not what you need when you're making good beer. But I did take a course that was actually in the business of microbrewing. It was not a brewing course. That has slightly got twisted over the years. So, it, and it was, and it was actually terrifying. After I came away from it, I was like, "Whoa! I don't think we're ever going to be, <laughs> we're never going to be able to do that." Um, but I, I didn't come at it from a very business mind, so it seemed much more, I think, step step by step to Jez and Mike when I showed them the course materials and that kind of thing. To them, it made more sense. To me, uh, it, it was just totally terrifying. Um, but I think interesting that you uh, mentioned that about having, like, when you have young kids, you don't have time to do this kind of thing. But I think the one thing that you do have when you have young kids is you have time to like have a certain kind of dreaminess, you know, because your kid is like watching Peppa Pig and you don't, you know, you sort of have time to sort of like, you know, you you, you do have a funny kind of time. You have kind of a lot of thinking time in a way um, and a lot of like semi hallucinatory sleep, de- sleep deprived sort of dream time. So I think, you know, that all kind of came into the mix. Um, I love that. You have this new kind of dream time as a parent. Yeah, I remember the early days of parenthood and it being this sort of um, this weird relationship with time where you'd you'd have this sort of when you're with your with your child, it, time kind of stretches out to you and you have lots of dreaming. Yes, lots to do, but often it was vacant headspace, right? And then and then when you're without the child and you're trying to work, it's like I've got to get a thousand things done in 10 minutes. Yeah. And so this sort of back and forth with this time. Yeah. So so tell us a bit about the MVP then. Was it uh, is this where Mr. Beer Kit came into the story? Huh. The beer, the beer kit actually came in. Uh, I bought it pretty much the the day after we had lunch with Jez and Libby. Um, so th- that was that was pretty quick. Um, it was pretty terrible as well. Uh, we'll admit there was nothing in that that eventually made it into anything to do with Brixton Brewery. Um, but um, but we no, we better. did we, we did move on to to do home brewing um, quite regularly. Um, with and, like you know, actual it was grains a, from scratch. Yeah, with you know, yeah, exactly, proper proper um, full grain brewing. Um, and then and then you know, eventually, what that led to the question of how do we then take the leap? How do we actually? decide whether we should leave our jobs to go back to your original um, your question. And we were quite lucky early on because we had this idea that before we made the leap, we should see if we could find someone to help us do some legwork to understand the true costs of starting up the business. Um, and 
we put a, a note up on a on a brewing sort of message board, and we had uh, one person come back to us, and that person happened to be someone who'd done a master's in brewing and business, and was free and was able to make a bunch of phone calls on our, on our behalf, and eventually would become our first brewer, and you know really enabled us to start the business evenings and weekends while this this individual was able to be there during the days um, and you know make the leap without going all the way and so the the plan was then that when it was feasible jez would go full time and um, and that would probably be enough from a, the point of view of a full time employee for the brewery so actually so chill um, and and Libby, his wife, and and me, we all kept full time jobs and just did everything on the side, um, which you know was, it's not necessarily the easiest decision from a time point of view, uh, but from a funding point of view for a startup, not being dependent on four salaries is pretty critical to to being able to fund your growth. Hundred percent, and and educate us a little bit about the beer making process um because for many people beer is beer okay and and you know what is the difference between a craft beer and then what were you trying to create with that first brewer that was going to make the brixton brewery become this fantastic new beer so you want to go, go? um well so we uh we were very inspired by the surroundings in brixton so all of our core beers we've got um a core range of beers and all of them are named after areas in brixton so our flagship beer which we thought was going to be really our most popular beer and which we based on our early home brewing is called electric ipa and it's named after electric avenue which is a street that a major <clears throat> excuse me thoroughfare Market Street in Brixton, which is famous for many reasons, one of which is um, it's the inspiration for that song, Electric Avenue, um, by Eddie Grant, which everyone knows, I'm sure. Um, and so we did, we were also we were really inspired by these sort of American style IPAs um, that were really, really hoppy and quite different in style to the British IPAs and to the British ales. Um, and we really wanted to bring a bit of that to Brixton and also bring in a bit of like a Brixton story and give people a little sort of taste of Brixton wherever they were in the world or wherever they were in London. <laughs> One day the world, but for the moment, uh, the UK. So I think we initially wanted to start doing, I've lost my train of thought a little bit, but. Um... <laughs> Making a beer. No, but you've described really well, like the, the beginning of yeah. this brand. And, and then how did you translate that into the, into the beer itself? So I think um, if I, I'll maybe jump in yeah. here because I think the, you know what 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 the the, the target you, you kind of need to target a product uh, for launch and yeah. what so Chiel mentioned about electric IPA was the one that we were you know playing with at home and and you know we were keen to make that the, the flagship but it was actually quite important for us to have a bit of diversification when we started so we actually launched with three different beers and. The thinking about it was, one, we wanted to be, I, I do struggle a little bit with the term craft, but we wanted to be craft brewers. Um, but also we wanted beers that were accessible to almost everyone, if possible, um, whether you're into craft or not. So we actually had um, launched with a beer called Reliance Pale Ale, which as it happens today, is the best-selling beer that we make. It's a, just a 4.2% pale ale um, with a, a, you know a little bit of that sort of hoppy floral uh, flavor and scent that you get from what people deem to be more of the craft style of beer. And then at the time, we also launched with an amber ale. So we tried to hit you know different spectrum for um, within within the segment, but for different drinkers and what different people might be interested in, so that there was. An opportunity to touch more people out, out, in, out in the street. So um, that was the starting point. And I think to you know, to your, you can stop me if I'm rambling here, Ben. But um, to your question about the process of making beer, I think you know what people probably hear about beer is it's it's simple. It's four ingredients, and you know you mix them together. You do some boiling, and then 
some yeast, eat some sugar, and boom, you've got this amazing beer. And what what we learned during home brewing was that it's important to be accurate with measurements and temperature and timing. What we learned when that was moved to an industrial scale, and I say industrial, but we're still only talking about a thousand liters at a time, nothing massive, is that any number of things can go wrong and that actually brewing is coined brewing, but actually probably 80% of the time that a brewer spends is cleaning. And, you know, there, it's, it's a really, really uh, meticulous job when it comes down to cleaning because any little contaminant can ruin an entire batch. Um, so, you know, it's the things you learn along the way um, that you, you don't really expect to be that focused on um, when you set up. And so the it's, cleaning it's like, process is, because this is fascinating, like what, what does that look like? Uh, it looks like, well, well, in, in the early days, it looked <laughs> like a lot of hoses everywhere, spraying water and chemicals and people climbing into vessels and scrubbing them down with brushes. Uh, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty intense. Um, and, 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 but, but also incredibly important, uh, because as I said, you know, one, one little bit of bacteria inside a, a thousand, thousand liter, um, piece of stainless steel can destroy everything. And, and, the, and the thing about, um, the fast moving consumer goods space is that a bad batch of beer going into the market. You know, you, you might, that might blow your one chance with a yeah. number of people yeah. who have just tried your product for the first time and yeah. don't like the taste of this and, and that's it. So, you know, being, being um, meticulous about cleaning, this, it sounds boring, but that, you know, that was a lot of the brewing in the beginning. And so the actually, first batch of electric. Go ahead, Socho. Uh, the first batch of electric IPA that we brewed, which I mentioned earlier, that went disastrously wrong, not because we hadn't cleaned enough, but because the uh, in calculating the quantities for scaling up um, didn't, <laughs> didn't quite go to plan, and it ended up um, something like three times over the alcohol that it was meant to be and basically exploding all over the brewery. So yeah. we, had our oh, share wow. of, we had our share of sort of kitchen catastrophes or brewery catastrophes, yeah. But you know they yeah. all they all feed into the story later, so yeah. those they are important. Part of the story, and and this is true for. I remember talking to the guys behind Oppo Ice Cream, and it took them uh, I think nineteen attempts to get their first to get their ice cream, and and you know they're the exploding ice cream everywhere, so which is just as bad, I'm sure. Um, so I was thinking, reflecting on that cleaning, really you should should be called um, Brixton Cleaners, right? But I guess it was. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Maybe someone already had the IP for that in Brixton. But on, <laughs> yeah, the point of, on the on the point of Brixton, and I'm fascinated by how cr the craft beer industry, but FMCG brands in general, do such a the ones that really you know we we build strong relationships to are great storytellers. So I was at the Doom Bar shop in Cornwall this summer, which now only does the cask beers because they've grown so much, and they're that all the um all the bottled and canned stuff is done in partnership in with a big brewery in Bedfordshire. And, and of course we know the the story of, uh, of Brewdog as well. But um, why did you want to put Brixton on the map for great beer? What was the driving force there? You know, Canadians coming into this, into this little London village, why did that matter? Or did you just see it as a kind of business opportunity? Uh, I think we saw it as a sort of irresistible energy that people would really love and really embrace. Um, and I see um, that we, ha I don't know, if maybe it's not fair of me to single out someone in the comments, but we've got Louisa from the Brixton Wine Club here, which is another fantastic Brixton based startup. So Brixton is, um, it's a great place to do. That's like uh, your cousin, do cousin startup, isn't it? <laughs> the Brixton yeah. Wine Club. Um, uh, anyway, yes. Um, and I think that we just we just felt like it it has this sort of that has this sort of spirit this kind of buzz this electricity and we felt as though it was something that would be a very good way to um, sort of tell the story of Brixton and share a little bit of Brixton um, help you know get people out there um, and give them a taste of this fantastic London neighborhood that's a sort of classic iconic London neighborhood with a fantastic rich history um, that we really thought would be interesting and attractive to people and to sort of tell that through the medium of beer. Yeah, and, and hopefully, 
we, we have, but we certainly wanted to, you know, make make a, a beer and a product that would make the community of Brixton proud to say right. that we have our we have our own brewery yeah. and it's Brixton Brewery. And the thing about Brixton that we've learned over the years, which I don't think we necessarily had had clocked in the early days, was that it it does feel that almost everyone that we meet has some weird or indirect if it's not direct connection to Brixton in some way, you know, they've been wow. through here. They've seen a concert in Brixton. You've got family that lived here. A friend of ours came to visit from Canada in the summer. Uh, I sent him home with a t-shirt and he was in like remote Canada camping <laughs> this summer and at the side of a lake with no one around him. And some person was walking by and ran up to him like, oh my gosh, you've got a Brixton Brewery t-shirt. I love that. I love that yeah, brewery. Nice. I used to live in Brixton. And it's just one of those weird Brixton connections that, that just sort of happens. I don't know what it is about Brixton, but it's it's got its its own energy and, and it seems like people um, are connected to it. So, yeah. you know, it's it's nice to have been able to, to build a brand that, you know, people res- also outside of Brixton. Yeah, and, and it's fascinating. And I, I, as you explain, tell that story, I'm thinking of a kind of a brewer from another mother, which is the Camden Camden uh, Pale Ale. Yes. Uh, and and it, have you sort of like, have you sort of uh, it's a very similar path to them? Or uh, because it seems, I remember when my brother started bringing it home, and I was like, Camden Pale Ale, what's this about? I mean, Camden's like just where the canals are, and the graffiti, and the artists, and the markets. What's this like expensive pale ale? But it's worked really well for that story as well. So obviously people love this sense yeah. of like, oh, this I is think- where this is from. Yeah, people do. They really like that, um, the sense of the community and the kind of um, getting a feeling that you're sort of getting something local. I, do, I don't think that Camden um, went in that hard on being in Camden or, or being sort of right. part of Camden. I think they, um, I don't want to speak for them or <laughs> say anything that they, they don't feel that they, um, that, that they agree with, but they didn't, they didn't really seem to sort of really go in hard on the Camden thing. Whereas we really felt like we absolutely wanted to be a very important or sorry, important, um, a, a big part of the Brixton community. We wanted to support local groups. We wanted to be a big part of the community. To, yeah, you know, so tell to, us a bit about how you did that, because even on the website now, it's like full of content and stories about different groups and communities and projects. How did you get that going? Well, uh, we started in a railway arch really in the heart of Brixton, in a sort of like the sort of industrial heart of Brixton, because there's the, the sort of market district of Brixton, um, which has all the food halls and the restaurants and that kind of thing but then there are the railway arches along um there are also sort of less well-traveled bits of brixton that's where we started um and that's where our uh, tap room is today and we also have a small um demonstration brew where we do limited edition brews and sort of smaller brews and and people can go on tours and that kind of thing there um and so we were physically in the heart of brixton which really helped we did um, Jez and, and uh, there's some good pictures of Jez and Mike from the early days um, delivering beer on foot to Brixton Market. So for the first couple of years of our existence, we really delivered almost everything on foot in the market. And then Libby heroically drove <laughs> drove around with her kids in the back of her car, delivering the things that went a bit further afield. So I think it you know it was a really um, genuine family and community business. Um, we bought things locally. We spoke to people locally. We got to know local community groups. Um, Jez and I joined the local business association to sort of help make Brixton a good place to do business. Um, and we started doing lo- looking for local partnerships. And we basically said yes to almost anything that was happening in Brixton if we were at all um, able to do it. So, you know, from the smallest school fate to something a little bit bigger, if we could do anything with them, we absolutely would. We really said yes to everything happening in Brixton at the beginning, and we've kind of continued with that ethos as well. We try really hard, although we are also trying to um, translate the sort of Brixton feeling for people further afield, um, who we think also might enjoy being a part of it. We do still keep a really strong focus on supporting Brixton community groups and being a really good local business and local employer. Uh, it, it's it's so refreshing to hear this kind of authentic being part of a physical place as a, as a business um, because obviously 
the world has changed so much. And um, tell us a little bit about the business journey then. Like, what, where did you? Because obviously, it's it changed dramatically in those from those early years through to when you got your first investment from Heineken in 2017. How easy was that journey? Because on paper, it looks like, oh, that was a breeze from <laughs> like start to exit. But tell us a bit more about it. Um, it was not a breeze. Um, that's for sure. Um, and I think, you know, to, to speak about the, the journey and, and to go back to something that you asked earlier, Ben, uh, about, you know, how, where we thought it, it, it might end up, you know, Jez was there full time and he was focused on it full time every day, all day while the rest of us were, you know, getting in there and doing as much as we could when we could. Um, and I think probably for me, and, and I don't know necessarily for Soch, but my goal for the brewery initially was to make enough beer in Brixton to service Brixton and make sure that the drinkers of Brixton were, you know, happy and you know they weren't they weren't going to be without their 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 Brixton brewery beer um and then over time as we added more and more railway arches to our to our footprint it became quite a complicated business logistically and right. railway arches unfortunately for uh, for us and many breweries that start there uh, cannot be expanded. Um, they are structural. Um, they're, they're structural uh, supporting. Um, Can't mess with them. <laughs> you, you, we we had two beside each other. We wanted to just drill a hole so we could run a pipe through the bottom of it. Not a chance. So you really do become landlocked quite quickly. And if you're growing and wanting to keep up with demand, continuing to multiply through multiple railway arches doesn't really help, particularly in brewing, because if you brew a thousand liters at a time, then that's all you can brew each time. It takes eight hours to brew that much, but if you have a vessel that's five or 10 times bigger, it still takes eight hours, but you've exponentially grown how much you can produce in that same amount of time. So the railway arches became a bit of a, a complication um for us and that was sort of around the similar time to when we first got the approach from from heineken which um i recall jez telling us about it and so jill and i sort of laughed at each other and said yeah that's ridiculous um because you know it's the second largest brewery in the world and we were like the largest brewery in brixton <laughs> um so so kind of we didn't really believe it um, and we didn't really know what to think about it, but over the course of the, the courtship and, and the discussions, which lasted over a year, I think we all came to the realization that there was an opportunity to be had to be able to grow out of the space that we were not so much stuck in, but locked into to a degree. Um, and make the leap to something much bigger and keep our footprint in Brixton. And I think for, for all of us as founders, that was really important. It was to not make the, the step from the small railway arch to a big brewery in Croydon. Or no a, offense, Croydon. With no offense, Croydon, but you're not Brixton. Still, still South London though. Yeah. <laughs> and, and those were the options that we had looked at <clears throat> for, for, for growth because of affordability. And I think what, with, with the investment from Heineken, it enabled us to keep our footprint in Brixton, to grow, to get the story of Brixton Brewery out further beyond just the one to two mile radius we'd managed to, to conquer um, under the railway arches. So, you know, that, that was kind of the journey. It was a realization that we could do more and that with the investment from Heineken, we could do it on our own terms, in our own geographic home, which was which was really really important to all of us. Also, and this was your social. Go ahead. Professional. Sorry. 
I think also having that professional ba that backing of a brewer that really knows what it's doing was was really helpful as well because you know when you're a startup you're kind of you know every you're winging ev absolutely everything and then to have someone come in and say oh yeah we know exactly what you need for you know to do this to make that bigger to you know to like analyze the quality of that sort of thing was like was fantastic it was amazing it was like you know suddenly having this sort of university course open to you <laughs> that you didn't have before when you had to learn everything yourself so um, I think on the on the one hand, it was you know craft beer really does sort of prize the independent spirit, um, but on the other hand, the opportunity was was you know massive for us, and yeah, we were really happy to be able to. And were there that. were there conversations around the kitchen table then about concern around diluting, excuse the pun, like the the the, the core value of the business, which you've explained a little bit around, like oh we get to take Brixton potentially to the world or beyond Brixton. Um, you know, I'm thinking as you tell that story of when Coke invested in innocent smoothies and it created this big, at least on the, you know, in the media backlash. Well, how can you take money from this global corporation when your brand is all about being innocent? Um, and obviously yeah. it's not quite, not quite that level. Right. But still Heineken ain't no craft brewery. This is a global corporation. <laughs> so were there some ethical yeah. tensions there or, or like, how did you feel? Was it really just like, there are so many positives we have to go for it. You know, I, there weren't a lot of ethical questions, um, although there is always that sort of risk that those things will come out that you don't have a lot of control over. Right. Um, but I think that it was such a, you know, it was such a big opportunity for us. Um, and I do think that we felt as though we could really maintain our ethos. Um, and Heineken really wanted us to. They've been very supportive in, in keeping sort of hands off um and really sort of stepping in when we need them or giving us access to markets and, and logistical help that we might not have otherwise had access to but they have really wanted us to get on and do what we you know why they took notice of us in the first place so they've been a good partner in that way but yeah i mean we were nervous i don't think yeah we were <laughs> we were definitely nervous yeah. um but i don't think we we were so small at the time, you know, even when we actually did come out with the news, like it made a bit of a ripple, but it wasn't, it wasn't huge news in the brewing, even in the brewing world. It's um, just exciting to hear that a big brand would take interest in a small and a startup like this, which doesn't, yeah, you think, I mean, oh, it, it doesn't happen until you get to a certain size. So that's great. Exactly. Yeah. It felt quite gratifying. I think they were probably a bit taken aback when they came to see us just to see how <laughs> small we were. Because I do think that we that one thing that we really got um, right uh, right away was the the branding and the sort of the image that we put out there, which I think yes. looked very, very good and very professional and um, fantastic right from the start. Um, you know, really lovely graphic design and really colorful branding that, you know, we it, it's worked out so well for us that we, you know, we really haven't changed it very much over the years at all. I was going to so, ask because it is so brilliant and craft brewery craft brewing now seems like a kind of art it's like an art gallery of kind of presentation isn't it i mean I, there's the beaver town glasses that i was in paddington the other day they tried to sell me a pint for eight pounds which was a bit shocked by but <laughs> I, I was like can i keep the glass because the glass artwork's really cool but, yeah. but have you always done the design in-house here's a little secret you can keep the glass there we're always delighted when people steal glasses <laughs> That's a Richard Branson technique. Yeah. Stolen from Virgin Atlantic. Yeah. It's yeah. very, yeah, it's very validating when people take the glass away. <laughs> there we go. Oh, sorry. Um, so, just... yeah, so, yeah, what the design, because for those who are you know, listening in, just go on to the uh, Brixton Brewery Instagram or, or the or the website because the it does pop. I mean, it's so bold and yeah, it's it's like the energy is strong. So, if, has that always been in house or how did you do it? We, it was actually, as it happens, it was yet another con couple connected by babies. Um, <laughs> our uh, Jez and Libby's NCT group, um, the, the baby class group, for those not familiar with NCT, um, they were a, a couple of designers as well. Um, and they actually came up with the, the initial uh, designs. Um, and when they did, it, it was, it was almost immediate that everyone of us looked at it and was like, yeah, that's the one. Um, because of exactly, I guess, what, what you've said, Ben, is we loved the color and we loved the pop. We loved that it popped. We used to, we used to play, uh, I mean, not actually play a game, but for us, it was a little game where all, you know, back in the day, all these craft 
bottle shops and, and shop, beer shops would, were popping up everywhere. And they would all have images on Twitter or, or Instagram uh, of, of their bo- wall of bottles. And we used to like looking at the wall of bottles without zooming in at all and being able to tell that you could tell exactly where ours were. They stood out nice. because they were so unique to all the rest of the, the designs, um, which, you know, again, from a branding point of view, it was fantastic because it did have that ability to sort of stand out from others on, on a shelf, which was great. They also usually have some nice references to Brixton, um, especially our core range, you know, little architectural details or little features that um, that people might know locally. So it's nice to have a little story on every bottle or every can as well. Uh, for the, For anyone who's interested in, in like branding and design and storytelling on physical products go deep on these guys uh site in there because there, it's fantastic um so yeah we're running out of time it's it's flowing by but um we want to come back to your exit and what's happening now in your world but uh charlie has just messaged to say uh tell me about how you have two couples building a business together with babies and what the relationships are like in the hard times how did you navigate that that is an excellent question. question. Um, the, what what I would say is that in terms of the the starting up a business with friends, first of all, I think in a weird way we were quite lucky that our initial meeting and conversations with Jazz and Libby were about beer, and we happened to then within short order, continue to discuss this and go into business together because we weren't super close friends from you know years gone by. And then I think that actually made the business relationship a bit easier because we weren't kind of walking on eggshells as much to protect a long lasting friendship. It was a bit easier for us to be blunt and direct with each other in that regard. Um, so, you know, that's fluke more than anything, but that's my feeling on the, the the sort of couples and friendship. As far as working with one's partner, um, there's nowhere to hide. That's there, what I there's say. nowhere to hide. Yeah, it's, all your flaws are out there. You know, you got to be someone different at work if you're not if you're not with your partner. But but when you are stuck with your partner, you know. You... Yeah, the the advantage. So did you establish is... Did you establish the rules early on? I work with a couple, and it's brilliant. But um. Did you establish rules early on where you're like, right, the conversation about work ends at this point? Um, no. It starts we, we here. In fact, in fact, we I was just about to make a cheesy joke saying the benefit is that you can plan dinner from the office, but the disadvantage is that over dinner you're just talking about work. Um, no, we do sometimes. Because we, 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 do, we do back down from it, and we, we do try to limit and, and cut each other off from it. But We do quite separate things at work. I well. think exactly, and that's, and that's what yeah. I was just about to say is that I think it's easier when your skill sets are very different and you can sort of live in silos and you're, and you know, going back to Venn diagrams, there's, there's less overlap. Um, and therefore a lot more trust in each other's expertise. And actually it was similar with, um, with not us versus, but us and, and Jez and Libby, all four of us have very different, skill sets and backgrounds so actually there aren't there weren't that many um areas where we had like conflicting overlap and views and expertise so it actually worked out quite well in that regard yeah and did you always have someone who was made the final decision so you didn't get into this committee mode of going around in circles we we did usually Yeah. yeah i mean it's basically jez We've kind of always been willing, not willing, but we've always had Jez be the final call on mm-hmm. everything. He was the one that was there full time yeah. from the get go, or at least from the point someone was there full time. Um, and therefore, we've always felt comfortable with giving our opinion. But if there's a decision to be made, ultimately, it's it's his. Yeah, and I think what you've just described, Mike, is one of those core values and skills of building a startup, whether you're with a partner, a sort of life partner, or just a just a co-founder, is that you've got to be prepared to defer your opinion to someone who makes the final call because it can't be done yeah. by committee. Um, yeah. Tell us about the the journey to, to to stepping back from the business for both of you and what 
that's led to now? Yeah, do you want to go? Uh, yeah. yeah, so in February 2021, or 2020, yeah, 21, uh, 2021 yeah. we sold the remaining shares of the of Brixton Brewery to Heineken. Um, and Jez remained as managing directors of Brix uh, managing director of Brixton Brewery. So he still um, got that really strong leadership role and it's still run essentially as an independent um, business. Um, and Mike and I stepped back to become consultants, both to Brixton Brewery, in which we're still quite involved, but also to support um, smaller and medium sized brands and community organizations um, wow. in their startups and the kinds of you know, brand building and um, finance for small business and that kind of thing um, that we sort of got so much experience doing with brewery. Yeah, and I think you know that it, it, it's a pretty, it, for many that might be difficult, uh, stepping away from something that spent so long building and pouring heart and soul into. Um, but, and I won't speak for social necessarily, I'll speak for myself here, but I've found it pretty rewarding to be able to, to step back and start working with other people who are you know fighting a similar struggle and trying to to, right. to get themselves off the ground with something new um and you know making that leap of faith um to 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 set themselves up for all the hard work that's ahead i think it's really difficult to be a single person founder we were really mm -hmm. lucky that we had the support of the four of us, you know, with each other. So questions didn't necessarily go unanswered. There was always an opinion and actually there were probably multiple opinions. So, um, so that, that was, that was quite, quite good. So I've, I've quite enjoyed stepping away a little bit, being able to give the strategic advice to, to Jez and it's ultimately his call because I, to very much agree with your point, Ben, you can't lead by committee. And actually if, all of us stayed on as co-founders and tried to to argue our way through every decision. It, it just wouldn't have worked. It makes more sense for one person to be there as the, the the ultimate decision maker. We can continue as we did in the past, give our, our opinions on on strategy, um, but it lets us also explore other areas and, and meet new people who are doing cool things. I think also. Um eventually your business if, if it's a business like ours that's sort of built on something that we were really really passionate about and really really interested in um eventually it then also becomes less about you because you maybe are like a little bit less connected to that world you know the craft beer world is very much full of people in their 20s and 30s and and then you know as we've sort of moved on a little bit from that that's been quite an interesting point for the business in which it sort of becomes less a reflection of us and more a reflection of other people and we've built a fantastic team um, and it's definitely in really good hands, the brewery. So I think, yeah, we do feel really comfortable with um, with what we've built, proud of it, but also ready to sort of do other things as well. Uh, it's, it's great to hear those reflections and to to exit a business in the middle of a global pandemic is a is a hell of a, a hell of a story. Um, quick quick reflection as we close on like Brixton. So, um, you know, we hear a lot in politics and um, some painful stories of what you know. Uh, so many people who um, uh, in the UK and in London who've suffered in recent years and as a result of like, you know, inequalities of economy and obviously racial injustice. Where's Brixton at today? And like, what part um, has the brewery played in, in helping? <laughs> oh, that's a really big question. And uh, I don't know if we can claim to have um, any role in the sort of greater harmony of Brixton, but certainly we've done our best to be a good employer that is um, supporting community groups. Um, and yeah, there are a lot of um, flashpoints and you certainly see a lot of inequality around Brixton, um, and, but it is a fantastic community. It's got a really strong sense of community. And I think in some ways um, it's well placed to um, come through those things, but you know, it's difficult for a lot of people. I can't, you know, I can't say it isn't for sure. And then finally, about your work now. So we've got a whole group of founders listening in who have, as you said, Mike, going through their own struggles. Um, how can you both help uh, them and how can they connect with you? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, one thing that um, I've been doing in, in my time away from Brewery is working as one of the business advisors for Virgin Startup, which has been uh, quite fun and, and, and interesting meeting the, the various um, people involved in, in their own adventures. But Sochil and I also run a consulting company 
to help with um, the help with some of the challenges that that people are facing when they're starting up their businesses. So yeah, if, if anyone is interested in, in speaking with us about that, um, you can find us on on LinkedIn and and ping there us a no message. There are no other social benjamins. There, there's there is only, only one only social one. benjamin. Uh, there are a few Mike Rosses. There, there, there are a few Mike Rosses out there. Think of that. <laughs> so chills linkedin is authentic yeah. no, no blue tick needed um yeah. it's been so good speaking to you both i'm really excited to to get my hands on some bricks and beers even though i'm nowhere near it um <laughs> but i know a lot of people who are so i'll be asking them about it thank you for giving us your time and thank you for being a business advisor to the community um and and just finally um if anyone's thinking about starting a business right now tonight they're listening in um, they look out out the window and they see the economic landscape and the the, the rolling news. Um, what would you say to them without obviously any context of their life and their idea? But um, what would you say as a word of advice in terms of thinking about is this the right time to give it a go? Uh, that is a tricky one, but I would say that perseverance and hard work do eventually pay off. Um, and it you know it may not be immediate, but um, you know, as I said earlier, you know, set your priorities and, and stick to them. Believe in believe in yourself. A lot of a lot of amazing businesses are started in the hardest of economic times, um, and you know, here we are potentially entering one of those times. So maybe what better time than to start now to do something that that's you know that, that that's your own and what you believe in. Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on on. Um what you have to lose. <laughs> um, it's maybe more nerve wracking if you know, if you have a lot to lose, but if you um, are, if you can start small, I'm a big fan of, of starting small. Actually the brewery sort of went in a bit bigger than I probably had the vision for initially. Um, and a little bit more, you know, slicker and more professional looking than I probably <laughs> could have come up with on my own. Um, so I think that, you know, you can start things small, you can test the waters, you can see how things are, how things are going and take it from there. Uh, it's, uh, you know, when you hear this advice from people who just run a blog, you kind of take it with a pinch of salt. But when people have built a brewery from scratch <laughs> in the last decade with with their partners, whilst having children and their friends, then you take their advice seriously. So, Mike and So Chills, thank you so much uh, for your time tonight. Um, and here's to uh, here's to Brixton Brewery telling the story of that great. great yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks to everyone. Yeah, th yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, guys. Good night. Cheers. Cheers.